All right, one of my favorite drum kits of all time, You Had, which was on the Back in Black tour. It's in the videos. It's a sonar kit. I want to say a natural finish. And I was I was always curious if you sold that kit or if you still have it. I've still got it. I've still got that. You one. still got it? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the second flashback episode today. Uh, every Thursday, doing a little flashback episode, bringing a, an old school Let There Be Talk to you from years ago that you uh, may have missed because you're a new listener or watcher. Which, by the way, subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit like so you don't miss any of this amazing content. <laughs> right now we're going to go back to November 3rd, 2020, when I had the honor of sitting down with one of the greatest drummers of all time. And I would say um, somebody that has probably some of the fiercest mystique on the planet, Mr. Phil Rudd. Phil Rudd, drummer of ACDC, on and off, I would say now. He's uh, not in the band, uh, in the current touring formation. And uh, a lot of people had uh, their ideas on why that was. Oh, he had legal problems, couldn't get into the United States. And and I, I knew that wasn't it. I've said it before. If you have legal problems, you don't even know how hard it is to get into Canada. Even if you got like a uh, drunk driving, you can't get into Canada. And he went in and made a power trip back in 2020. So nobody knows and nobody ever will until somebody in the camp says what's going on, which they will not. ACDC is a tight lip organization. And that's what made it even more of an honor to sit down with all of the members back in 2020, including Phil Rudd. Phil Rudd is one of the most amazing drummers because he is definitely the king of feel. Nicknamed No Phil Phil, which is amazing. What people don't understand is uh, people like Phil Rudd, Ringo Starr, guys like that that are king of the feel and groove and also able to just be in a band and just kind of almost be invisible and let the music do the talking. Phil is unbelievable, man. And, and it's total proof. Whenever you see a different drummer in ACDC, it's not even close. And I do the Bon Scott Bash once a year and every drummer sits back there and they're all some of the best drummers on the planet. And they even say, man, Phil is, is something else, you know? I'm talking about guys like Dave Lombardo, Josh Freeze, and uh, Steve Gorman, killer drummers. Everybody always is uh, shouting out high praise for Phil Rudd. It's a great episode. It was back in uh, 2020. He had not really done many interviews that I know of, really, I don't think, maybe, maybe five. I never ever hear Phil Rudd talk. Man, it was it was a great day. He takes a couple shots here and there at people. It's pretty amazing. He's uh, he holds no punches. And uh, at, towards the end, my good friend Bill Burr pops on, and they talk helicopters. And boy, did his face light up when he could talk about helicopters. That was a, a topic you could tell that was deep, uh, deep and dear to his heart. So anyway, thank you guys for checking out the flashback episodes. Enjoy this one. And don't forget about the tour dates coming up. March 8 and 9, I will be in Fort Collins, Colorado, headlining four shows at the Comedy Fort, one of my favorite clubs. And then the following weekend, I will be in Minneapolis at Acme, uh, a club I've been trying to do for 10 years and I cannot wait to do. So there you go. Get your tickets at DeanDelRay.com. Hope you enjoy this flashback episode. I love you guys. Keep the candles lit. Here he is, Phil Rudd. Well, 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 what do we have here? It is a special election day podcast. 
And I'm going to tell you right now that I vote for my guest today, Phil Rudd of ACDC. I vote for him as the greatest drummer of all time. And I mean that. When you think about what this man has done, his groove, his feel, his uh, influence on zillions of drummers out there. Yeah, you have all kinds of uh, drummer wars. You know, Neil Peart, Bonzo, uh, you know, all these guys. All these guys, I say. Those are the two guys that people always bring up in battle. And I always like to drop the Phil Rudd card. And then people look at you for a minute, and then they go, you know what? You could be right. It's, it's, it's unreal. It's unreal the last few weeks here on Let There Be Talk. It has been a... Uh, it, it has absolutely been a dream come true. It's, I still am speechless that when I, when I try to talk about it, I just kind of say, well, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess I got lucky. I want to thank Jay and Kim over at Columbia records for fully believing in this podcast and bringing these guests to the show. They know how much it meant to me, and uh, I will never be able to repay them, and I cannot thank the band ACDC enough for, uh, for doing this. These guys are deep in their career. They don't need to be doing a podcast. They could just drop the record, the planet goes crazy, and be done with it. But like I've said before, these guys are solid, solid humans. They are not the big rock star. Uh, they are the rock stars, but they don't play that, that, that game. And that is why I think one of the number one reasons why the people love this band so much. And uh, to sit down and talk to Phil Rudd is just... It's just insane to me. This guy, for all these years, I hear it over and over. I just heard Lars Ulrich a couple weeks ago say that Phil Rudd was the greatest drummer of all time. And um, I hear every drummer that I ever hang out with. Steve Gorman from the Black Crows, Brad Wilk, uh, Dave Lombardo, all these guys that I've had on the show and that have played at the Tribute to Bon Scott with me, Ronnie Crawford, drummer after drummer after drummer after drummer has said, Phil Rudd is the man. And I want to thank Phil for doing the show. It was, uh, it was, it was a, beyond an honor to have you on, buddy. And I want to thank all of you once again for uh, tuning in. The ACDC family out there, all of you, um, the chat boards, on my Instagram, on my Twitter, everywhere, giving me some uh, big love. It's been a very, very cool ride, and uh, it's it's sad that it's it's winding down. Who knows? I'd love to get Stevie Young on. But um, I'm not going to get greedy. <laughs> to be able to talk to each member from that back in black era is unreal, man. It is unreal. And I hope you guys enjoy this one. And by the way, I thought of a, a very cool thing to do. And, uh, you know... I, 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 I met Bill Burr nine years ago. We bonded over ACDC and music. He has been a mentor to me in, in my comedy, and he has done numerous cool things for me, and I'm always trying to find something cool 
to do for him. So I wanted to invite him on for the last 15 minutes or so because Bill loves Phil Rudd as much as I do. And I really wanted to have him on. So hang in there. The last 15 is really cool hearing Bill ask Phil Rudd helicopter questions and drum nerd stuff. So uh, it was great to have you on, Bill. I love you. You know that. And uh, right on. Before we do get into it, I'm sure there's a lot of drummers listening today. And you probably got some aches and pains over the years of playing drums. You got some creaks in your joints. You're going to need some CBD. CBD CBDLion.com is the place to go. The cleanest CBD in the world. These guys are third-party tested. This ain't that truck stop shit. This ain't that stuff just sitting on a counter at a flea market. This is real deal CBD. I've been using it for a year now on my uh, severely shattered neck, and it has helped 100%. Also, I do have a little trouble sleeping, especially during the election time cbdlion.com they got the tinctures that help you sleep they got the um they have the lotions they have pet tinctures which are great if you got a cuckoo pet use the code dean d-e-a-n get 20 percent off every time not one time all the time use the code over and over and over it helps them it helps you it helps me cbdlion.com Use the code DEAN. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the new podcast. I have a second podcast called The Grail with Dean Del Rey, and that is on iTunes, YouTube, all those spots, SoundCloud, Libsyn, all over the place. And that's going to be uh, where you can find all my handmade uh, podcasts featuring all kinds of cool creators and makers guitar builders motorcycle builders denim makers boots uh watches cars everything guitars guitars guitar drums uh we had some drum people on all right enough babbling i read the reviews you guys are that fucking guy talks too much at the top <laughs> Once again, here we are, ACDC, new records out, November 13th, power up, see the new video soon, Demon Fire, spread the word, let's welcome to the show, Phil Rudd. Oh, let me tell you, man, this is a, I got goosebumps right now, this is a dream come true to talk to you, because, uh. I'm obviously a giant ACDC fan, and I got to talk to Brian and Angus and Cliff, but I've always wanted to talk to you. I feel you are the, uh, the special uh, sauce, the secret weapon. You are the ACDC groove, man. How are you, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Now, uh, I have the first question I have for you, and I've always wanted to know this. Um, who were your guys? Uh, who were the drummers that you were rocking to when you started out? Well, Ringo, you know, Charlie Watts, Cozy Powell, Ian Pace, just those 60s guys, you know, the, the British rock guys, you know, the, um, and Ringo is a sort of always a special, a special kind of a dude. You know, so. Cozy Powell? Cozy Powell, he was great, mate. He was great. Oh, he was great, yeah. He was great. He had he had that really great attitude, cozy, you know, really, really great. So, what is it for you on the drums? Are you are you sitting around? You see the Beatles on Ed Sullivan? Is it that like everybody else on the planet back then? No, I heard Tin Soldier. I mean, that, that's, that was that was probably the start of the whole thing for me. I think I heard um, Steve Marriott, Steve Marriott, and the boys. You know, they uh, cranked it up pretty good. And that that kind of that, that's what really motivated me, you know. That just love the way that song starts. You know, so. 
And so was it drums right away or did you want to be a singer or guitar or bass or anything? Or was it drums? It was drums, yeah. I wanted to leap into that, whatever that Steve Marriott thing was, you know, at the start of, at the start of Tin Soldier. I just wanted to get in there, you know. So it was, it was great. It was a great feel at the start of that track. It's it a great track, that one, Tin Soldier. You know? So what do you do? Do you do you ask your parents for a drum kit? Do you get a job? You go out and search one out. How does this happen? Well, I had to get, I had to get a job, and um, and they, the, the old man, signed up for me so I could buy a kit. Uh, so um, I was away from there. I went pretty good. It's funny to think about Ringo Starr because he's so underrated, right? Oh, it's just the feel, mate. You know, it's the feel. We see him playing with Carl Perkins. And Eric Clapton on that uh, Carl Perkins birthday birthday show they did. Oh, he's just, mate, he's just hot. He's just on it, you know. I can I show that to people, you know, who don't, who don't get it, you know. I say, well, you know, listen to this. And they go, you know, all right, you know, yeah, shit, you know. Because he really has got something happening, Ringo, you know. He really has got something, something extra special going on, you know. And Charlie Watts. I mean, Charlie Watts, I always say there's three bands to me that without the drummers, they just are not what they are. Zeppelin with Bonzo, ACDC with Phil Rudd, and uh, Charlie Watts with the Stones. I mean, those three, and they all three are totally different. That's just, that's just how you go up, you know. <clears throat> we're all, we're all, we all come from a sort of organic place and, you know, and the, whatever grows on us. You know, sort of grows on us as we go along. How long uh, until you get into a band, once you get your drums, how long till you get into Buster Brown? Is it pretty fast or are you taking lessons? How does this happen? I was, could I, well, it was only a couple of years, a couple of years, I think, before I joined Buster Brown. I don't know, it lasts for a small, small couple of years. And, uh, and then, you know, I fell into ACDC and, <laughs> what, a, what, what a life, man. You're like, yeah, I think I'll pick up drums, play a couple of years, and then join this band, and we'll become the biggest band in the world in about 15 years. That is wild. The guys knew where they were going. I wasn't, I wasn't really sure what I was doing, but they, you know, Angus and I, they, they knew where they were going. You know? but, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I, just, I was just kind of there, you know, and I just tried to keep up. <laughs> so, do you, you remember what brand that first kit was? Uh, the first kit was a lovely a Ringo kit that I bought because uh, I had a, an old Premier kit that I painted a few times. And, uh, so um, I had a lovely kit and then a, a Slingerland kit that was my first sponsored kit. And I got, then I got hooked up with Sonor and, um, and because they, they make such fantastic hardware, um, I've never been able to go to anyone else since. I mean, I mean, you are the sonar guy. That's just all there is to it. I mean, when I think of Phil Rudd, I think of straight up sonar. You know? Well, yeah. Well, you can't. You know, I, I, well, I think, when I think of doing a gig, I think of sonar too, mate. You know? I mean, that's nothing else. You know, it's, everything else falls to bits under you. I mean, there's a lot of hard hitting guys around, but I don't know. You know, it's, um, I seem to go through a lot of equipment. <laughs> I, I especially think about. Uh, like let the be rock. When you think about the pounding on that, like in the film, yeah. you know when when they're bringing in another snare and everything, you're just thinking about the the drilling of that. Oh yeah, no, it's, it is. It's great. I mean, it really is great. It's uh, it's life at the coal face, you know, and yeah, you know, it's it's great. Really, really good. Yeah, you know, it's just part of it. You know, it's part of the you know, the whole commitment and uh, you know, I don't know, madness really, I suppose. Let's talk a little bit about your audition in ACDC. I, I uh, had read that you went in and auditioned, got the gig on the spot. Do you remember what songs you played at the audition and what it was like? Oh, the band, they just had the first album come out, High Voltage. And um, so they were playing a few tracks off that. And um, I hadn't been really doing much for a few months. And um, when I heard about it, I just w went around there and there was a kid around there and had a bit of a bit of a bash on that and, and uh, we, we seemed to hook up pretty well from the start I was, I was pretty energetic and kind of you know charging along there so <laughs> I, I kind of like, like my sort of thing you know and um yeah I'm just, it's just 
got on on that basis ever since, really. Once you get in the band, uh, do you go out and tour some of the high voltage stuff, or do you go in and do the TNT record right away? Uh, we were touring. We were touring it when I first joined the band. It was only, it was only a few weeks in, and we did that big festival in Melbourne, in Sunbury. It's uh, the famous Deep Purple show uh, in the mud, but um, um, yeah. So, but we we were we were recording an album just about every year for, for the first few years there, and um, so as they came together, we, you know, we'd play new new songs off them because we were still doing a few covers, you know, to make up the numbers. Um, so, you know, as our repertoire sort of you know, got bigger, we sort of grew with it. When you first come in, I know you were, uh, I'm not sure if this is correct, but from what I've read over the years, that you were pretty tight with Bon. Is this right? Uh, you know, bon, you know, bon, was, bon was a friendly guy. You know, I took him home for Christmas once and you know, all that sort of thing. Everyone, everyone loved him. <laughs> it, was, it was great. He slept on the couch. and you know, it was, oh, I think he did. I can't remember now. But, um, yeah, it was, he was a good guy. He was pretty chilled, you know, so... Because he, he was from Adelaide, so we'd be recording in Sydney, and I'd drive home to Melbourne for Christmas. It's just getting too complicated, it sounds, sounds like it. But so, you know, we'd have a break over Christmas, and sometimes you know, Cliff would sometimes come down to Melbourne, or Bomb would come down and you know, sort of hang out with me and the family and stuff. Bomb was, he was, he was a good guy to have around at Christmas time, man. He was a party guy, you know, he was, a, he was a, he was just a good, a good buzz, you know, he was a, just a good buzz, you know. That I mean, that chemistry of by the time you guys kind of really get it going and get, you know, get over to London and do the Let There Be Rock record, it's 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 a punch in the face, man. You guys are so smoking live. I mean, you guys were just doing like hundreds of gigs, right? We were, yeah, we worked. We worked really hard in the early years. Oh, we still work hard when we go out. We still work pretty hard, but um, we were, you know, we were doing in, in Melbourne. We were doing four four gigs a day sometimes. You know. Whoa, really? No shit. Oh yeah, no. We, we um, the course of the sword pretty good because oh, the, the management was paying us a wage while we um, while we did as many gigs as they could find. <laughs> so, oh wow! So you were kind of like salaried, and then they would just say, "Here's your jobs." For a while, yeah. For a while. We had support. You know, we had support from the record company and and, you know, and the guys, of course, Angus and Malcolm supported the whole thing a lot. You know, when we first went overseas. So, you know. That's that's just amazing. So, so it was it was pretty good. You know, we were, we were a pretty de- determined little bunch. You know, so you know, yeah. What can you tell me about the differences between Mark Evans and? Cliff, because the bass and drums need to lock up. What do you think? What is the difference between these two type of players? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, Cliff's the great bass player, and um, well, that's probably about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. There, there's the difference right there. Amazing. Wow. It, was it a case of just kind of once you got out on the road and you were really playing that the the caliber of the band rose above Mark Evans playing? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not saying that you said that, but that's 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 fair. You know, that's fair. That's fair. I would say, you know, because we were all, you know, like you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to get the shot that night. That night, to be honest. So. Oh shit! Really? Wow. You know, like you, you don't really know what's going on. So there's a meeting tonight, and, and uh, so you know, so the, you know, it was we just decided we had to develop, you know, like musically, you know, the guys did anyway. And of course, Cliff, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, he's um, you know, he's just smooth operator, you know. That guy's incredible. Do you remember some of the other guys that came in and auditioned, or was it just Cliff, pretty much? Um, oh, we went. We went through quite a period there trying to find a bass player. You know, we had a couple of guys who filled in. We had George did a few gigs with us. You know, we, we could have kept him, you know, but he was he wasn't 
really interested in going back on the road again after his life in the Easy Beach, you know. So uh, one guy was, was gone speedy because it took so long to get it, to sort of get the idea of anything. Sadly, he passed away recently, but um, I was uh, uh, I'm sure it wasn't any of that fault. But no, we had, we just had different people fill in. Of course, Mal um, Mal played bass for a while because he was a wicked bass player as well. You know, Mal could. He, oh really? Oh yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, and that's quite something, young Malcolm. And uh, but you know, we had to, you know, the, the songs weren't they weren't three piece songs, you know. So we, you know, not wanted to get back on the guitar, and so and so we eventually found because it was because we had a shop pretty wide to find him, I guess. You know, not a lot of not a big reserve of you know guys. I mean, you got to find guys who are at your level and sort of at your in your space, you know, I mean, you got to find guys who fit in and can play and still fit in, you know. So you can't be too clever. We don't like clever, you know, too clever. You know, like, you know. So, you know. Yeah, you can't have some guy up there that's kind of just, you know, John Entwistle style where they're going all over the fretboard. That's not going to lock in with an ACDC type of groove. I'm off and I'm slapping it and go down some cross. Different strokes, as I say. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It is an interesting um, style that you have. It is unbelievable. And I know one thing about it for sure is whenever I would jam ACDC with people, they right away would be like, wow, what is he even doing here? It seems easy, but it's completely hard. And I think it's because you were just born with that swing. That's what it is. It's the feel. Yeah, well, I would like to think so. You know, it's, um, that's the whole idea. You know, it's to, it's to make it swing. So you tap your foot. You know? That's the idea. So, and we're, and we're all about that. <clears throat> you know, Angus is especially about that. <clears throat> you know, it's all about the feel, and it's got a rock. You know? So, have you heard all the all the album then, or have you just heard? Have you just heard uh, "Shot in the Dark," or have you heard the other tracks off the album yet? Oh no, I've heard the whole record. Absolutely. So what do you think? I really like Realize big time. I love uh, Demon's Fire. Uh, mm -hmm. sh Shot in the Dark, of course, is great. And um, what's the one, Witches? Uh, I think it might be. I, I'm still waiting for a copy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. It's a great record. It's it. it it's so great to have you um, back in that that seat. You know, uh, there you are. You do the rocker bust uh, record, and then you you get into some trouble, and we don't have you. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some of your uh, some of your your time. Uh, I did read once uh, that this letter that recently sold. Bond wrote a letter to his sister and it went up for auction recently. And there was a section in there where it said that uh, Phil was having a rough time on the tour, a little depressed and stuff. And I was always wondering if, if, if that was maybe uh, a little bit of overworked because rock can just get to you. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We all have ups and downs and, you know, I've, I've, I've had a few, few down buzzers as, I, as I've gone along, but I'm, I'm pretty good shape at the moment so. yeah 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 you look fantastic and uh like i said it's great to have you back in it was uh it was a bummer when you weren't there for the rocker bus tour let let me ask you about uh the filming of the movie let there be rock do you remember that because i think it's one of the greatest concerts ever shot it's kind of underrated uh i think it's fantastic and it really captured this time of you guys just being a fierce fierce machine yeah no i, I do remember i do remember making that it was an interesting time you know it was a good show of course thanks for that i love the porsche 928 on it you a porsche guy uh well not really i uh not really a porsche guy so um, I was that day was the first first time I got my hands on anything like that in my life. <laughs> it was like let me in. Was that your car or just borrowed? No, it was just borrowed from Porsche. You know? I was real careful about you know where I was, where I could drive it and everything. I mean, Cliff took off in it, you know, like went to town. Yeah, so um, it was pretty. I was pretty cold those days when we were do, doing that filming. 
Well, you got to you know, you got to get busy because it's so fucking cold. <laughs> 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 when you look back at the uh, the era of uh, before Back in Black, of course, and you really start to you're starting to do kind of a slow just build up. By the time you get to Highway to Hell, it's it's completely a different ball game when this record drops out. What did you think about uh, that that whole Mutt Lang coming in and just killing it on that? Were you just like, we're on another level now? Well, you, you can't doubt much commercial you know, viability because he, he makes stuff much more radio friendly. You know, whereas the boys are a bit more traditional with their brother George. So, and that's you know, that's personal choice. Everyone's everyone's welcome to have that. You know, so, aren't they? Yeah, they are. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm digress. Um, so um, Matt was, you know, he was, he was Matt was really good to work with. The guys enjoyed working with him, and Matt respected Angus and Malcolm hugely. You know what what they were trying to do and what they wouldn't do. You know they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't do this. They wouldn't play a you know, fruity notes and make nice sounds, and you know, you know, they get on the production, the big production bandwagon, and just sort of let that whole thing get lost you know, lost and all that, you know. So they were, you know, they were trying to keep the band, you know, a good blues based sort of a thing with you know I mean, oh, some of those early records sounded pretty good, you know, and there was um, there's some great guitar sounds. Holy shit, you know. Night Prowler? I mean this has got to be one of the greatest A C D C songs of all time. There's a lot of there's a lot of lot of stuff out there I guess that people have never heard because you know, it's, it's a vast catalogue that we've got and, and um, everyone has highlights. What do you remember about the Eddie Kramer sessions? Brian said that, uh, or no, Cliff said that uh, Eddie Kramer came up to you and said, "Hey, try some, try some rolls and fills and stuff." And you said, "Yeah, you got the wrong drummer there, buddy." <laughs> uh, he just wasn't the right guy, you know. I mean, that's, a, that's how I can really put it. You know, he just wasn't the right guy for ACDC. We and we were just trying to get rid of the guy, you know. But, um, we managed to. You know, with, uh, when the Brian auditions come down, I talked to Brian about it uh, quite a bit, but do you remember some other guys that came in and audition? And was the decision a band decision or was it just the brothers that decided on, on Brian? Oh, the, the brothers were they're, they're, they're making the decision, but they'd, you know, they'd look around and, you know, sort of, you know, they'd want to know what you thought. And, you know, so, and, you know, Brian was just, I mean, fuck. <laughs> He just come down and just fucking ripped it, you know. Like, he was just amazing. You know? He still does, mate. He's amazing, that guy. You know, he, he's just amazing. He really is. When you hear the vocals of like "Shoot the Thrill" or "Have a Drink on Me" or "Hell's Bells," those are insane vocals, man. Insane. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're insane for anyone to do. You know, but for a, a, a for a, uh, I said, no, nah, for you know, for a well-travelled old bugger like Brian, it's, it's amazing what he does. You know, it really is. We had a great party in, in, in um, Amsterdam. We had a, we had a ball, and three weeks of jamming it up and playing the new stuff, and you know, it's killer. And then COVID hit, so we, uh, oh. we had, to, had to park it up. God, it's such a bummer, right? What do you think about? What do you think about? Um, I, I personally love Flick of the Switch, and this is kind of the time where you uh, leave the band after it's recorded, but what do you think about the choice of not using Mutt Lang again once they got to Flick of the Switch and that whole thing? I don't really know. I, don't really know. I didn't have anything to do with it, so it's, it's, um, it depends you know, who you use. You can't always get who you want because they've got other, other things on and, you know. So, you know, sometimes you can't just sort of cut and paste it how you like. You know? But um, I think um, we come out pretty good in the end. You know, we ended up doing a couple more with George. And then, uh, of course, there was the, the um, Rick Rubin period. I won't go into that too much. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, when you when you come back, they do the Rick Rubin record and no one cared for that uh, as him producing. Is that correct? No, 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 no one. No, we didn't really get on with Rick Rubin, I don't think. No, I'm pretty sure we didn't. No, we didn't. He was, uh, I mean, 
No, he's Rick Rubin, you know, but I mean, uh, uh, and so much good to us, you know, like, you know, uh, sort of, he's made some good sounding records, you know that about that. He just didn't, he just didn't have the boy's vision, you know. But uh, Brendan O'Brien, he's, he's got that pretty well covered, you know. Oh my God. I mean, you know, like uh, the Rock or Bust record and the new record, it's, it's really like sonically, I mean, he's killing it. He's killing it with ACDC. Right. You know, I, I agree. I agree. Right, so everyone's pretty happy. So, yeah, glad everyone likes it so far. It's coming out in a couple of weeks, isn't it? It's coming out on the 13th. 13th. Yeah. 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 How does it happen um, that you, after you have your troubles before the Rocker Bus Tour, how does it happen that you come back into the fold after that tour? Or is it at Malcolm's funeral that uh, Angus talks to you about coming back? He, no, he didn't. I, I, Mel and I had a, uh, Angus and I had a good chat at Mel's funeral and we caught up, you know, and a lot of them. Um, now all that crazy shit had gone on, but since then I sort of got my shit together and put a little band together and went to Europe and was doing a bit of playing and stuff and did an album and you know the guys knew I was still playing and stuff. So when I caught up with Angus at the at the funeral, we were sort of chatting away and you know and, and somehow <clears throat> he just sort of seemed to think that I was up for an album. So he started writing one. Apparently the next day he went to the studio at home, so started, we started writing straight away. So, and then we got to get the old call. You know, going, pack your bag. You know, see you in three weeks. So, right, here we go. I love somebody got some spy shots of you, spy photos. You know when you guys were recording up there, and it was like, oh my god, it fills in, fills in. That was the big news. This guy can't be in the street, guys. Phil, I said, mate. You got the wrong guy. I'm not even here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. What about back in 91 when they're on the Razor's Edge tour? I had read that when they got to New Zealand, they kind of called you up to come on down and hang out. They were kind of sniffing around to get you back in back then. You don't come back in until 93, but they were asking around 91, correct? I, th I think so. Yeah, I, you know, I think so. I, I, I wasn't really there, so but I got the idea that they were, you know, they're thinking about that. So it's just nice. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, every everybody wants you back there. That's that's really what it's about. You know, it's it's wild to think about uh, anybody else back there. I mean, you know, Chris Slade's good, and and. And Simon Wright's good, but they're no Phil Rudd. Were you paying attention to the group while they were out with the other drummers? Were you listening to it, checking it out in, at all? Well, uh, you know, yeah, sort of, it, was, it was always sort of my gig, you know, but, um, but it wasn't, you know. So, I mean, you know, you, you, you shoot, if you shoot yourself in the foot, well, you know, you've got to, you know, you've got to expect to, um, to you know, you've got you to front up and, the piper, so yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, I mean, that I, I was doing really well, you know, with the Razor's Edge and everything, which, you know, which was great for them and not so great for me, but that's all right. You know? I mean, it was, it was, um, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I can't really recall my whole life up and down since, you know, I, was, I get know. it, I get it, man. Let's talk a little bit about your body playing drums all these years. Uh, how's that? You you all good? Your ears, everything? Great, great. I haven't got a, I haven't got a, I haven't got an ache or a pain or anything. You know, and um, no, my body's in great shape. When I, I haven't been going to the gym as much as I was, but you now that's just been lazy, I suppose. I, prefer, I get fit while I'm playing, you know, so. You know, usually before we do anything, we usually have a few weeks rehearsal or something. So I kind of get my, my match fitness up then. Because um, you can't train to sort of be a hands to not hurt or whatever, you know, because you, you're initially going to get a few wounds, you know, like, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Playing drums like you play for 
two and a half hours uh it's it's definitely a it's it's a it's a hard gig man it is a hard gig and high volume the whole time i mean that that <laughs> that shit's on 110 db supposed to be easy though Dean. You know? it's not supposed to be easy mate you know? it's supposed to be hard and you <laughs> and uh and that's the point you know you know it's, we don't play stuff that's easy it sounds easy to play but it's not what you play is it? it's how you play it when you see all age cliche for the books Let's talk a little bit about rec uh, recording of the new record. Did you go up there and you guys just started tracking live uh, and and burning through the stuff? How did that go down? We were putting stuff down from the first day. And um, we had a day of getting some sounds together, you know, a, a drum day and a, you know, sort of, um, and we went in and once we were at the cans all set and we all set to go, we just start knocking, knocking, the ideas down. So Angus had plenty of ideas, and he was getting together with uh, Brendan and you know, coming up with a few shapes and sizes for the day ahead. Away we go. It was, it was pretty good fun. It was, it was, it was pretty good fun. It was, um, yeah, well, it was good. I've never enjoyed playing like I like I do now. I, I, I love playing more now than I than I ever had. You know? So. It's, um, I'm not sure where that come from, but uh, it's just, uh, you know, yeah, I feel I really enjoy getting out and playing with the guys. You know, it's, it's great. Cliff was telling me that you guys really like this studio. It, it has a great sound, and it's like all glass front, so you're not like in a box. And uh, it, he said it's really got a good vibe in there. You feel the same way? Yeah, yeah. yeah like I'm, I'm shoved in a box, but <laughs> you know, that's okay. <laughs> they build a room around the kit and they shoved me, they stuffed me through a hole in the back door and, you know, let me out for a cup of tea every couple of hours. But uh, it's, um, it is a good it is a good studio to work in, you know. And we've been working with our engineer, Mike Frazier, for so long now. He's, you know, he's always got our stuff up for us. And, you know. Yeah, that guy's amazing, right? I mean, he, he obviously knows how to get amazing drum tones. He's amazing. He is amazing. What are you using on this? Is it 22 bass drum? Uh, yeah, 22 inch bass drum, pretty standard. So they, they sound great, those Sonor bass drums, man. They got so much weight. You know, they, they're just great. You know. They are fantastic. Where is Sonar made? Uh, Germany, the, the, all the good stuff's made in Germany, and the, the other stuff's made in China. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious that the new record i tell you the video is fantastic oh my god shot in the dark video how great does this video look pretty crisp eh? it was pretty sharp right? where'd you guys shoot it at you know in amsterdam wow what's going on out there you're in new zealand right you live out there you got a studio and stuff you got a band that you were doing um no, just just home with the family, and um, I, don't, I don't do it. I don't do anything when I'm at home, really. Just sort of you know, get down to the family, and uh, I still do a little bit of a little bit of flying, and um, I've got a couple of cars and stuff. Not quite down quite a bit over the last few years. What kind of cars you got? Uh, uh Ferrari and a McLaren. Which Ferrari? Four eight eight or something? Uh, five nine nine. Five nine nine. It's a beast, man. It's a beast. Which which McLaren you got? I love that. What is it? The seven oh two or the that one? Oh my god! The early ones, the five five forty C. It's it's a, it's a maniac. It's, it's so quick. I took this mate of mine as a cop for a ride, and you know, and he should have arrested him. Should have arrested himself after that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't drive. You know, I've, I've sort of. Not as nuts as I used to be, but you know. But um, I've got five kids. You know, I've got uh, four grandchildren, and uh, there's a couple of them around here somewhere. Actually, all the girls, very well nailed down. Family now at this point. Any of them play music? Um, not really. They're all sort of they're into fitness and gyms and stuff like that, you know. But yeah, lifting weights and all that sort of stuff, you know, I do all, all muscles. And, you know. 
let me ask you this. You got any vintage drum kits? Do you, do you uh, collect drums or is it just straight up sonar and that's it? Mate, I haven't, got, I haven't got any room to collect anything. I've got so much shit and storage that I don't know what to do with as it is. I, I've, got no, I've, got, I've got stuff stacked up. I don't know what to do with it, you know, drums and Christ. I've got, I've got, so, much, I've got so much drum stuff. It's like I don't know what to do with it all, mate. You know, I've got cases full of snare drums of all sorts. And you know, and I, I'm, not, I'm not so much into vintage stuff, you know, like, you know, I like the old Ludwig snare drums, you know, like John Bonham used to use, you know, and Ringo, of course, you know. And um, it was always a classic sounding snare drum, but apart from that, I've always used the old Gretsch, old Gretsch, uh, chrome over brass, and, um, you know, the guys like those for a certain clomp they get out of it, you know. And uh, and live, I, I, play the, I play my own sonar snare drum, which I've been shot at, you know, which is great. I love those old black beauties, you know. Yeah, yeah, I've got a, yeah, I've got a few of those. I've got, I've got them in this, and I've got them in that, and I've got them. I've got, I've got one that Sonar made for me. It's made out of bell bronze. It weighs about twenty-five kgs. You know? you can hardly, you can hardly lift it up. So you can try that. Try and lift it up. It's made out of it's about this thick. Oh, it's made out of bell bronze. It sounds like shit. It's like a steel pipe. I shouldn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, novelty stuff, you know. Just, but um, I like stuff that works, you know. It's like I like cars with brakes. I like, you know, I like drums with punch. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's just sort of. Are there any songs in the ACDC catalog that you would love to see in the set list? I mean, I'm into like Squealer or Soul Stripper, some really classic deep tracks. Are there anything that you would like to see in there? Oh, I don't know. I, mean, I I love Squealer. I, I I I've got that on my on my turntable all the time, right on Squealer. I play them all the time. You know? They're just such fantastic tracks. You know? Bon Scott is he's just he's just something else, isn't he? You know? and I'm, I'm I'm really only appreciating that the, at this age as well. So, you no, know? yeah, it's good. I, I um I don't know. It's it's. But we always try to record stuff that we could play live. It wasn't much good putting out a, a, an album full of songs if we went out and you could only play half of them live because you, you have to sort of play, you know, you've got to find more stuff to play live. And that was the, the thing. If you can't play it live, don't record it because other people would use, you know, extra layers and you know, other voices and all sorts of shit, you know, to gloss their stuff up, you know. Whereas we were kind of, you know, more... Real, try to be more real than that, you know. So, when you look back at the Bond uh, era, what's your favorite Bond era record uh, out of that run? Oh, uh, Power Age, I think, it was a, you know, that was Chris' first album as well, and um, it was it's a great album. Uh, but it's got a couple of things on there that are you know, that people really like, but we don't necessarily play them live because you know we kind of we we sort of our aim is to kind of beat you up when we play live, you know what I mean? You know, we're, not, we're not trying to be nice to you, you know, we're trying to beat you up. So, that's what, uh, so you know, we don't like to be too nice when we get on stage. We like, you know, we like to give it a good hiding and go home, you know. As Mel said, follow that. <laughs> what was Malcolm like, man? I mean, he's such a he, – he's so great. He was the band leader and stuff like that. But what was he like? Just a pure rock and roller, huh? Well, he, he was really determined. He was really, really determined. You know? And, um, and that, that, you know, and that's probably the, the one thing that would, that would describe him best, if you ask me, determined. But, yeah, he was a, you know, we were, we were all developing as people at that stage, Dean, and we all, went, we all had ups and downs and we all sort of, you know. You know but, yeah, that's all good. He was a... He was, was a great guy. He knew, he knew he knew exactly what he wanted, you know. And that was a that was a great thing about Angus and Malcolm. They knew where they were going, you know. And you have to have that. You've got to have a direction. And they wouldn't be moved from that direction. They wanted, to, you know. So, and here we are with our how many how many how many album <laughs> how many how many album by now? So, and I still. Still sounds, still sounds great. I mean, you know, sounds great. 
It's unbelievable, man. I mean, your band, it's it's legendary. There's there's no there's no better rock and roll band ever. And in the entire history of just straight ahead rock and roll, it's ACDC, the songs, the guys, the logo, the tours, the stages, everything about it is is perfection. So I would want to trust the side of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just and it's just uh it's it's amazing, man. I mean, rock and roll hall of famer. You're in the rock and roll hall of fame. Yep. Yep. I am. The first time I saw you guys was 1978. It was uh Oakland Coliseum on the Power Age tour. And it was cheap cheap trick, ACDC, Journey, Blue Oyster Colt, and Ted Nugent. Do you remember these Day in the Green shows? I do, yeah. 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 They were we, we made a pretty pretty um, good impact of some of those shows. They were, they were filling the place up by 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning so they could see us, and it was pretty good. You know, they, were, they were great, those stadium shows. They, they, did, they really you know, they propelled a lot of – they just brought a lot of people to I mean, that's got to be mind-boggling to come over to America because you're over in 77 – and you're doing clubs like the Whiskey A Go Go and the old Waldorf in San Francisco, and they're they're really small clubs. You come back yeah. a year later, and you're playing uh, a summer run on these massive baseball parks. That had to be a rush for you. Well, it was. It was. You know, we, we were we were kind of you know, we, we were up for it, you know. So you know, <laughs> yeah, we were up for it. It was all good. We worked out well. We're still up for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I hope that you guys are able to tour somehow on this Power Up record. This Power Up record is it's smoking, man. And I think if we could see these songs live, it would just be even more insane, you know, because like Demon's Fire is a classic riff rock and ACDC song. I would love to see this song open up the show with it, you know. Well, I think we'd all like to get out there and you know, let a couple go. But we'll have to see how that work, how that plays out. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let me check this here. Oh, I was going to ask you: Are you a comedy fan? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm quite a comedy fan. Yep. Yeah. Well, who do you like? Uh, like Rowan Atkinson. I like the Black Adder and Poldy Towers. <clears throat> um, Brooklyn Nine Nine. Quite a fan of that. Brooklyn Nine Nine. Oh yeah, I love that. I love that show. Wow, that's great. I, I know uh, a friend of mine, Chelsea Peretti, is on that show. I'm a comedian. Oh right. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, they're great. Those guys, they're great. I love that show. I love that show. Oh wow, that's awesome. Do you watch any live comedy on Netflix? Not too much. Not too much. I sort of. I love the. I love like the the. the I love the Black Adder. I'd rather watch the Black Adder again than, you know, I guess I'm, I shouldn't say that, but I'd rather watch something old that I know I like than something new that I'm not sure if I will or not, you know. Is that good? <laughs> no. Well, I brought my buddy on right here. He's one of my best friends, and he is a, a, an incredible comedian. I work with him all the time here in the States. His name is Bill Burr, and I wanted to, ha I wanted to have him on the last part of the show here because – he is a helicopter pilot also, and really? yeah, and he flies us to the gigs, which is very uh, wild, and he wanted to talk some helicopters with you, so uh, let's, let's bring him on. How are you, Bill? You got your face there? I think so. Wait, I got to click on the video? Yeah. Oh, there yeah. we go. Start video. Yeah. We got, there we here go. Here we are. Now, now, Bill and I do a tribute to Bon Scott every year. And it's a massive show we do in Los Angeles. Bill plays some drums, but he is the one one of the number one comedians in America, a fantastic human, and a helicopter pilot. So he said, I got to talk to Phil about some helicopters. So let's get this going. Right. Yeah, I was wondering when you learned how to fly and what you flew. Good day, Bill. How are you, mate? Hey, how are you? I'm good. I, when, I, when I come to the settle in New Zealand, I started to fly helicopters because they're all over the place here. You know? They were chasing deer around doing live recovery at that time. And it was a pretty exciting time in the helicopter business because 
You seen what those guys do? Cat live cover, live recovery. Yeah, I thought that you guys uh, don't you guys do you like herd animals with helicopters down there, right? Well, they catch deer. Well, they, they they chase deer through the bush and net them with a with a net gun, and the guy jumps out and ties it up, and they hook it on and fly it out of the bush, all that sort of stuff. I took Brian and Cliff out. And they both they both got a deer with, with my mate, the guy who taught me to fly. They went a bull, mate. Was, well, what's that? Are you are you fly, Bill? Yeah, I fly uh, Robinsons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like the, like most of my, I only have like about two, 260 hours and I, I got them all pretty much in the R22, but I just got into a deal with some other pilots. Have you seen that, uh, that Cabri G2? Yeah, 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 I've seen it. yeah, yeah, so it's basically the guys in France bought an R22, took it apart, kept all the stuff that worked and then improved on everything else. So it's like a three bladed main rotor system, fully articulated, so no low G pushover. Right. None of that stuff. And you can actually auto-rotate between 30 and 50 knots, which blows my mind okay. because my entire time learning how to auto-rotate has been in the 22, which is you just drop like a stone <laughs> until, the, until the last second. That's so good. I've, got, I've, I've done – I did I had an R22 for a while and a, uh, a couple of years I had – I learned it, learned in that the Robinson, of course, like most people do. What are you flying these days? Uh, I haven't got a machine at the moment, but I had a D model for a couple of years, uh, Hughes 500, and recently I had a, a Notar uh, MD 520, which was a Notar helicopter with yeah. no rotor. It's a lot of fun to fly, sort of. Kind of. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah. No complaints from the neighbors with that. All right. Can I ask you a couple of geek drum questions, and then I'll get out of the way? All right. All right one of my favorite drum kits of all time. You had which was on the Back in Black tour. It's in the videos. It's a sonar kit. I want to say a natural finish. And I was I was always curious if you sold that kit or if you still have it. I've still got it. I've still got that. You one. still got it? Yeah. <laughs> now, do you, do you keep all of your kits throughout the years? Um, no, not really. I mean, I have drums. I have warehouses full of drums if I did that. I've been around for a long time, Bill. You know, but, uh, all right. <laughs> So I was. What, what was it about that kit that that made you keep that one as opposed to other ones? Oh, it was just fucking gorgeous. I mean, it was just gorgeous. It was just. Uh, it was the. Uh, there was. There's never been anything like that signature series. That was a signature series sonar kit with the uh, ebony or babinga inside and out, you know? and it was beautiful. It is beautiful. The chrome still. The chrome is still brand new. It must be forty years old. They were gorgeous with those white heads on them, too. I mean, it was just absolutely gorgeous. And then the last drum question I have was um, I learned so much through your playing. I really did. And like a lot of, you know, young kids coming up, when they look at you or like Charlie Watts and guys that are just playing for the song, you think what you're doing is easy until you play about five years and then all of a sudden you just have that thunderclap moment of how difficult what you do is and how little margin of error there is when you play the way that you play. And I noticed with your style early on, it was like, say, like on jailbreak, there was a lot of fills. It was a little busier. And then you kind of you narrowed it down to sort of that that thing that is the foundation of the ACDC sound and. One of my favorite albums of your drumming is when you sort of, it seemed like you combined both was on the, uh, for those about to rock album, where it was the busiest I had heard your bass drum, but it still never got in the way right. of, of, and I was just wondering when you're just playing that two, four thing, how do you always seem to know when to add that extra eighth, not to play a quarter to do like and three or one and two, just, and it just, it gives me, it makes the hair, to this day, I've listened to some of these songs for 40 years, it makes the hair on my arms stand up. I was just curious as to what, is that just an instinctual thing as you're playing, or do you work that out before you record it? It, it is pretty instinctual, because I've got a really bad memory, so I can't remember, and I can't remember anything, so, so I just wing it, you know, basically I'm winging it, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort of shoot a few shots where the guys are sort of looking for them and stuff, but I'm, basically I'm just winging it, you know. There's no, you know, it's no rocket. There's no science to it, really. Was was the style that you have was was that um, 
something that you came up with feeding off of what Malcolm and Angus were playing or was it something that they, they had input on just saying, just play it more straight ahead or is it, how did you come up with that style? No, they, they were they always like it sort of more straight ahead, you know, because if they were playing something, they didn't, they didn't they didn't want me pissing around doing something else, you know. They were, they were trying to play something. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like, right. So you just carry on, you know. You just you know, my thing is a different thing to their thing, you know. It's a you know, it's the sum of the parts, you know. That you don't have to play the same parts, you know what I mean? Right, you know, which is yeah. So. I think you're playing on landslide on flick of the switch is so radical and the tempo and the speed and the violence of that plane is just fantastic, man. I mean, I love that is the cliff or the Phil Rudd of let there be rock landslide, these straight ahead, fierce rock and tunes. Well, thanks, dude. I mean, we're all listening in different ways. I mean, I, I wouldn't have listened to that song for across of my own years now. <laughs> I remember Spellbound, but uh, I can't remember everything. Spellbound was like what I loved about that one is just as far as like the tone of it was like ACDC's a lot of positive stuff, and that was one thing that kind of dealt with like a depression a little bit and right. life going a little bit rough. And I always felt like that was like a hidden gem. Did you guys ever play that one live? I don't believe so. No, I don't think I don't. No. Do you ever get any input on on the set list? Um, not really. You know, it's sort of really. <laughs> it's kind of like you know, it's uh, you just look at it and hope you can make it to the end. <laughs> you know? so, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think I, I'd say at this point, I think I, I know what you're doing, Dean. Do I got time for one more geek drum? Question? Yeah. I hope I'm not annoying you with this. Uh, I must call you Mr. Rudd. That's the level of respect that I have for what you've done over the years. On um, on uh, um, Shoot to Thrill, right. the breakdown, that I've never been able to get through that song without hitting rewind at least three times back to when it goes down. I, I ruined so many cassette tapes doing that. And, of course, I'd go out and buy them again. I was wondering, do you, are you, how many drums are you playing on there? Are you just riding on the floor, Tom, and just accenting on one rack, Tom, or you got two? Oh, I just got, well, I just got one. You know, I just only ever used one in the studio. And I got oh, off, you did off that sort of multi rack thing quite a while ago. You know, it was, um, I couldn't reach out that stuff anyway. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you ever see that kit? What he has in the in the jailbreak video? Yeah. There was this there, there was this moment in time on one like bass drum mount. They they would in a triangle formation. They would put those tons. Swing a line kit. And it used to fucking used to go over used to go over forward all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why that those things didn't catch on. Uh, I knew there had to be something. <laughs> you look nuts. Well, I just I just wanted to come on real quick. Dean was so nice to let me come on. I I can't I cannot tell you like the influence. You even influenced. You're such a good drummer. You even influenced my comedy as far as economy of words. Right. I'm just applying what you do to a song. To telling jokes and everything, so I hope this stupid COVID thing. What's that? I'm getting off here. I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch some of your stuff. Soon as I get off here. No, well, don't watch it around the kids. <laughs> I'm not the best joke writer, so I got to let them fly a little bit. Um, I'm so excited for the new album. So excited you guys all got back together again, and I hope this COVID stuff goes away so I can see you guys live as soon as possible. Cheers, mate. All right, Cheers. all right. Fly safe, and uh, I'm so psyched you still got that drum kit, Dean. Thanks for letting me pop on. Phil, thank you so much for doing the show. It's unreal. I mean, like I said, I, I, I wanted to talk to you my whole life. That's why I asked you the crazy questions and stuff. But it's just, you're Phil Rudd, man. And everybody, I mean, Lars Ulrich last week was saying Phil Rudd is the God. And that's how all the pro drummers feel. Everyone we play with all say Phil Rudd. It doesn't matter who it is. So, it's amazing to talk to you, and uh, thank God you're here playing on this brand new record, Power Up, and it's incredible to see it. And thank you for doing the show, man. You're welcome, dude. Thanks, Mike. It, it meant the world. That's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, dude. Cheers, mate. It's been a pleasure. See you later. All right, Bill. Fly safe, buddy. I'll see you. See you, Bill. See you, buddy.